So the panel discussion today is called Should Photography Be Taught? And uh, my name is Alisha, I'm a writer and I'm a part of the Kashmiri Photo Collective. Uh, Vasif has asked me to moderate this panel because I argue with him all the time and he's hoping that if I ask all my questions here today, he won't have to talk to me for the next two days. <laughs> I think that's the primary reason I was chosen to be up here. Um, I'll begin just by giving brief uh, introductions. So in fact, I have been teaching at um, the extremely famous photojournalism school in Denmark called the Danish School of Media and Journalism since 1998. Um, he was a photojournalist himself for about a decade uh, before that. And um, he's been coming to uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, and sort of facilitating uh, exchange between our countries and uh, DMGX for quite some time now. Um, Professor Karen Fromm uh, is a, is teaches at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Hanover. She's been there since 2011. Um, her research background is in uh, photo theory, documentary. She studies art history, literature, culture, and media management. Um, and uh, she has come also to uh, Bangladesh before and also facilitated exchange between uh, students from Pachala and the school at Hanover. Uh, Munim Wasif, of course, has been teaching at Pachala since 2009. Um, so between the three of them on the panel, you have about 40 years of experience in photographic education. I thought we could begin today by actually thinking um, if we woke up tomorrow and all photographic education had been declared abolished, what is it that you think would be lost? <laughs> of course, many things would be lost. If I would say, oh, nothing would be lost, then we could all stop and go up to the cafe. But of course, I'm deeply convinced that many, many things would be lost because I'm uh, my opinion is that more and more nowadays we need photographic education, not only to create um, photographers who go out into the world and take pictures, but also because we are in a culture which is more and more surrounded by images, and I think there's a deep need for visual literacy, and um, I think our study courses on photography are also um, places where you can teach this and maybe um, teach the, the people who can go out in the world and know how to reflect on pictures, how to deal with them in many different ways, and not only by taking photographs. Um, yeah, I, of course, not surprisingly, I agree with you, Karen. Um, but I think another thing that, uh, that schools of photography do is that they also become the, the center of, of knowledge of photography. So we are also the places where, where this knowledge can be uh, found for other people. So that means that, for instance, at, at our school, we do a lot of work where we teach uh, at, at primary schools, high schools. So it's not only about educating uh, photographers for the business, which is actually not very much that we do, but it's more about also educating uh, people about photography and how to use that in their in their daily life and how to who to read the images that they get in their daily media or on their social media. So I think that's that's uh, quite an important part of the of the role that uh, that a photographer school should also play. I think I have a different role here. Uh, I don't teach photography uh, because I'm a teacher. Um, I'm a practicing artist and I came into teaching by accident uh, because one of my friends who was teaching, he went abroad and Abid, who was my teacher, I don't know if he's here, he asked me if I can teach for a few days and that end up in the last 10 years, which is a <laughs> quite difficult choice. But I think it all depends on um, what we mean by schooling, you know, what we mean by teaching. Um, I have really struggled in my childhood. Um, to enjoy the way we have been taught uh, in our school, which was uh, uh, sometimes more about remembering things and writing what you have read last night. And it was quite a nightmare. Um, and uh, I was lucky that there was something like Pakshala, 
Um, there was someone like Shurdu, thanks God he was traveling all the time, so he was not teaching. Uh, uh, but he left the space for us where we have always managed to argue with each other. So for me, school is a place where you can start dreaming, you know. And sometimes I think the schools can be also traumatic. So it depends how we look at teaching and how we look at schooling. So I don't think there is any yes and wrong. Sometimes, um, uh, look, I, like a lot of my favorite artists didn't manage to really succeed in school. So one of the greatest painter in Bengal is S.M. Sultan. He never fitted in these educational structures, but he is the most charismatic artist in the last 100 years in, in Bangladesh. So it varies. So one of the... Um things that I think may have changed, because obviously even at Chobi Mela this time, we're looking at amazing work made by photographers that never went to any type of uh, school that taught photography necessarily, is the idea that there is now quite a long history of photography and a way in which the image has transformed and morphed and become a part of society in a way in which it, it didn't exist 50 years ago. And so would you say that, um, this idea of the, that there is a history now of photography that needs to be understood as also a big part of why the educational system needs to exist around it. Not being so much just about, okay, we learn how to make photographs, technique, etc., but that there is a lineage to this practice now that needs to be understood. Yeah, um, but I think, I, I think you're right that uh, a part of of learning photography is not about learning the technique because basically what what I think that we kind of agree on is that that teaching photography is basically not about photography. I remember we, we talked about it earlier today that that for us it's more about uh, teaching about life and that's and that and it's teaching about being a citizen and it's about being a uh, and uh, a citizen who is interested in in the society and who contributes to that. So I think that's that's main, mainly more what we are doing uh, at our school. And to to be able to do that, history plays an important part. Not only the the history of photography, but also the political history and all other kinds of of things that you need that you build on. And um, and I think just like like any other skill, like literature or something like that, you can't um, you can't do that without actually knowing something about what you what you stand upon, which shoulders are you standing upon. And I think that's also part of what we what we have to do at the at the photography schools. So it's not about it's not about learning how an icon or a Canon works because you can teach that in a week. So, uh, so it's the rest of the time that's actually interesting. Yeah, I would also say that all the other things are really important and it's more like looking at contexts and putting things together. But um, we had that actually before in a conversation. I would also raise the point that it's somehow important to start somewhere and I would say we put photography into the center and we try to be an expert with photography and then look where are all the connections, which kinds of synergies can we use. But it's not, you know, if we start with whole life and how to be a good citizen or whatever, then for me it seems to be, it can be anything. And I think there's this importance of being an expert for something and then to see how it's changing and all the needs are changing and then you have to keep up and see how it's evolving. I mean, I would, yeah, how exactly do you teach someone to be a citizen, right? I mean, this idea of the teacher-student relationship carrying the burden of uh, uh, transmitting values of a certain kind, right? Uh, that the teacher-student relationship should create the basis of humanity that you know that you inhabit. Then, when you go out in the world, I mean, that's a big burden to put on the state of not just what teachers are expected to do, but also um, the idea of what being a student means. I mean, is it a space of, does it have to be a space in which we are thinking of molding at all? Or does the idea of being a student actually need to be left open 
to experimentation, failure. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. I was wondering what you would say about that. That what does it mean to be a student, really, when you're dealing with the image, and why this emphasis on ideas like citizenship and values is necessary. But um, I think that I can I can come I can come up with an example that when 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 we teach at uh, at our school um, we have very few um, assignments like exercises we actually don't do that so it's not that we ask the students now you now you need to do this exercise because then you know how that works and then you need to do this exercise because then you know how that works because if we do uh, too much of that, then we only prepare them to be uh, machines, photographers, machines for the media. So actually what we do is that every time we have an assignment, we ask the students, what, what do you want to tell? What, is, what do you feel is important? What within this topic do you think is the most important thing to address in, uh, in your life and from your point of view or from where you're standing? So all the time we ask the students to come up with with their, uh, their own story, their own approach. And I think that's, uh, that's one of the ways that you can actually do this, that, it's, that you ask them to, to take a stand in, in life. And you don't have to agree with them, and you don't have to be like the teacher, because the, the teacher is, is the facilitator of that. So we have to be like the filter that, that can filter all these, these ideas, all these things, and ask the critical questions, come up with uh, ideas or photographers that have worked in the same direction. So that's basically what we, what we do in, in order to, to make them think about society and think about the, the stories. I would agree on many points. I would also say that for me as a teacher, it's more giving the space for the students to find their own stories, their own projects, to create them and to support them by that. But I also think um, that that our work is to, to give a special structure somehow, because I found out, you know, you've been teaching a lot longer than I've been teaching, but um, what I found out during the last six years, I think, it is always very good that you define time slots and, I don't know, thematic slots, what might be the topic, not do something about structures in nature or whatever, not assignments like that, but um, you, you, you give it a, a frame somehow. Because I found out when you say, okay, go on, work on a project you like, blah, 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 then usually with some students it works very fine, but very often they end up with nothing. And I have the feeling it's not only that in the result you have nothing, or only very little, but um, it's that they don't really start working. So I think it's, it's a bit of the structure and also of the open space inside this frame or structure. Maybe. I think the most difficult thing to teach students is, uh, you know, um, learning how to be a sensitive human being, you know. Um, to make sure that all your senses are active, that you can smell, you can see, you can test, uh, you can say no to things when you disagree. Uh, you can fall in love and uh, really appreciate. You can be extremely vulnerable and protect yourself. Uh, so you have to give methodologies to students. You have to give them skills, you know, to be confident, to, to be able to achieve that they would like to achieve. And what they do with those skills is completely up to them. Uh, but it also depends on what kind of teachers you have and what kind of place you are in, you know. Um, like in our context, you know, Shanti Niketan by uh, Romidonath was a classic example where, where he have created a school where uh, it was not only about uh, going to the class, it's also about being in an environment which automatically transform you to be a different human being, you know. You see a tree in a different light, you know. You, and nowadays it's very different. I remember when I uh, came out from a um, college, at that time the private university culture were going really high in Bangladesh. <laughs> and uh, we have a course called BBA. God knows what does that mean. Uh, that everybody was 
is 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 like um, having a hot dog. You know, you go and get a degree of BBM, then you get into a bank. But what I was very shocked when I went to uh, give tests to those universities, those are like concrete structures, and there was no space around. So, and then when you go to Dhaka University, where all the big movement happens, you have big streets. So the moment thousands of students gathers in a square and they talk about something, it creates a very different kind of resonance. So um, I think job of a teacher can be also very limiting, depending on how you want to also see yourself as a teacher, you know. Uh, now teaching and education also is very commercial. It's almost like a commodity, you know. I know a lot of universities, in a lot of schools, you know, the admin tells their teacher, think the parents are like customers, you know. You give them a, you satisfy them, and that they talk about openly. So there's a whole idea of teaching as a moral, moralistic point of view, you know, teaching is ideal. Those days have been gone, I don't know what rest, but at least in Bangladesh, you know, how much money you spend on teaching, it depends on, you know, where you go through. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's a big difference, you know. I don't know how many people in Bangladesh has went to, uh, abroad to study photography. It's just simply because it's not easy to get that much of money. So, the, I think there are a lot of things that are involved, um, yeah. Yeah, this, I think this idea of teaching as customer service does seem to be a bit of a global play, though, because, uh, it's uh, definitely not something which has come up just here. Um, but there were a couple of very interesting things that I think just came up in what all three of you said. The first is this idea of uh, stories, right? When the students come in, whether you're telling them to find their own story or kind of guiding them towards a story, this idea of storytelling is somehow still embedded within the infrastructure of photographic education. And you talked about photographic education being commodified, but the idea of storytelling has also been commodified. There isn't a single small or big brand that exists today that isn't talking about, learn how to tell your story. This is our story. And particularly in the visual realm, it's become endemic. So as uh, coming out of a history of photographic education that has been so embedded in the idea of storytelling, how do we break out of this, or how do we kind of create a new language that actually challenges the existing commodification of storytelling, which is highly visual? Um, yeah, and how are you doing that as teachers today? Anyone else? <laughs> that was a tough one. Um, I think the, the most important thing that you, that you can do at, as a teacher or as a school is to uh, allow the students to fail. Um, I think that's, uh, that's rule number one. Because uh, if, you have that, if you have that space in the, in the school, if you have that, that mindset that, that you're, not, you're not doing the story because it's... Um, because it's going to be in this and this magazine or on this and this competition, but you're doing this because you are interested in it, or because you're interested in the people, or because you need to learn something. And then, because of that, you might fail, but because you fail, you learn. Um, I think if you if you have that approach, I think you 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 manage to do that actually. Um, but I totally agree with, with you that it's in, in this neoliberal society that especially us coming from Europe live in, it's really hard to do that. Because uh, we are also kind of looked upon from the ministry, from the, our partners, from the media industry to kind of succeed. And to, what you get in here of students have to go out here and it, they have to be a success and we are measured. and they have to be a success in a specific amount of time and with a specific amount of money and and that puts a pressure on on the students because they live in that society so i think that's that is uh, maybe if we should lift the discussion from
from how to teach photography, but more about how to be a photographer. I think that's some of the things that, that sometimes can be a, a conflict in the student's mind, that they have this society pressure, and then on the other hand, we at the school, we can say, say, tell them, yeah, but just feel free and do the whatever you like and do the mistakes, and, uh, and uh, this is a space for development. And so there's kind of a contradiction in this. Yeah, I think this is not only a con or can be a conflict in, inside the students, but also for you as a teacher, because of course um, you can say we open the space and we give them all the freedom to de develop their, to develop their projects and everything. But of course, there's always this market question, you know, because we live in a world where everybody is ruled by economic ideas and an economic system. So of course, our universities are also part of it. And that's what you mean probably by telling that we get a lot more pressure. The whole Bologna reform in, in whole Europe and um, cut all the courses down to very small elements so that our students have to do a lot of different courses and to collect their credits and everything. When I was studying, it was completely different. So, so that's also kind of this economic system, that they have to study for a short time, they have to get ready, and of course, when they study photojournalism and documentary photography, they worry after they've started and studied for one or two semesters, what am I going to, going to do afterwards, and can I make a living on um, taking photos or working in this field? And uh, of course, we have to talk about these ideas, and we have to, um, I don't know, open spaces, give advice somehow, and, um, and give them the chance to experience the market also while they are studying, and we really try on that. But I think also it is very important, if you think at a, about a university as an institution, that um, a university is much more than just preparing young people um, for being part of or taking part um, in the economic market afterwards. I think a university should also be a space, and it used to be a space like that, that um, gives the chance to reflect on society and to, uh, to kind of open a meta discourse and to think things over, work like a think tank or whatever. So it's a lot more than saying you need this and this and this so that it will work for you and this is how the market works. And it's also even ridiculous if we would say that because the, it's changing so much, especially in the world of photography and the photo photographic market, that we couldn't tell now how it will be in 10 years. So that's really important, I think, that you are in between these two. I completely forgot what you have asked. Story telling, story telling. Yeah, yeah. You didn't answer that at all. Yeah. That's, that's why he's a good teacher, no? <laughs> it's called pure revision. Yeah. That's, what, that's what politicians do. I'll ask the if question. If you're answering the question, they just answer something else. That people and then I'll ask the question again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's it. I think this word has a specific meaning in for of you know, storytelling, because we learn it again, again, and again, and God knows what does that mean. Uh, because a lot of times it becomes about illustrations. Um, and if you look at storytelling in other forms, especially in literature, also in film, that has moved away um, so much from <coughs> traditional storytelling uh, and developed in multiple different forms. I think um, in photography, there was a strength once upon a time because it was related with certain kind of with printed technology. And uh, photographic storytelling, a lot of people understand storytelling actually from magazines. But those world doesn't exist now, you know. And this whole idea of storytelling comes from the, with the idea of editing, you no? Know? So when you don't have pages to lay out your images, how do you tell a story? Is, is there any other way of teaching storytelling or talking about storytelling? I think there is. There are much more powerful way of um, uh, telling stories. It can be just a single image. It can be about millions of images together, like collage, like what Rashid Rana does in Pakistan. Or um, it can be, I don't know, a um, film by Chris Marka, where using stills, but there are voiceover, there are sounds, but he's telling a story. 
Um, I think with storytelling in photography, the form play also a big role. What kind of form, I know, what kind of content can fit into a into form? And I think we really need to shake up these uh, these words and find um, I don't know different rhetorics to understand uh, what does storytelling means. And I think we have to go far away from photo editors for sure to photo editors. Uh, to understand, because in photography, I felt, at least in my generation, photo editors are the one who uh, decides how the story should be told in a lot of cases. And a lot of cases, the photographer doesn't have an even authority to decide what kind of text will go with, with that story. So I think that the, the whole notion of storytelling need to be more independent and more experimental. Um, yeah. So I was uh, speaking to Ghoni earlier today, and we were actually talking about how there seemed to be with the kind of uh, almost collapse of the magazine structure, so to speak, in terms of the amount of work that it generated for photographers, that, as you're saying, this power of the photo editor would kind of dissipate and break, and something, you know, suddenly we have a space where you're forced to create something new, but somehow, the book form seems to have become the new norm. This pressure on photographers that, you know, the, the thing to work towards now is a book, and that you should try and find a way to find someone who can edit your work into a book, and the book is the method of presentation, somehow slowly seems to have been seeping uh, into that space, you know. And so that's, uh, yeah, I wonder if, you know, there's always a way in which people will lean on one kind of structure or another? And what do you think about the way the book form is starting to play a big role in photography? And where does it figure within the space of your teaching with regards to uh, when you begin teaching, is it often first through photo books? And uh, in our part of the world, the access to that kind of material is still very recent now. You know, the circulation of books, etc., in photography has become a lot easier, but it wasn't necessarily the case even a decade ago. So I'm wondering what the role of the book has become. Could I before add something about the storytelling? Because I, that's an important point I'd like to mention. Um, I think it's always this search for finding the right word and with storytelling which seems to be very fashionable now it's more like it's not really reflected i think it's that what you were referring to it's more like a marketing tool and we found out that somehow because the economic market and the media are kind of in trouble. It's not so easy for photojournalism anymore. And then we also want to open up for other ways of working with photography. So it's better to say storytelling because it seems to mean the whole. But I think most of the people using this word and also using it as something as a label for something that they are doing, they didn't really reflect what means story. Because I think a lot of people think it's like someone tells a story, starts somewhere, you know, goes through a kind of evolution, and then it ends somewhere. And we all know that all the important topics right now, maybe projects should focus on, they are not that easy. They don't have a starting point and they end somewhere. And by always searching for that, we create a fiction that things can be kind of handled. We, like, we put them into containers. So I think it's not that um, we couldn't use the word. Maybe it could help us, but we should reflect a lot more on what kind of stories are there. So maybe it would be easier to find another word. Nobody will answer about the photo books, I have to. Um, but I, I think that uh, uh, I agree with you that that's right now photo books are maybe one of the things that people aim for. Um, personally, I, I don't see uh, I don't see the outcome uh, when, when we talk about the stories with our students. I don't see one specific outcome. I think one of the things that, that we have to teach uh, the, the students is to see the stories that they, that they make on different platforms. So it's not only about making a book, but it, maybe it's about making a book and some Instagram updates and an exhibition or a poster or whatever it might be, uh, activism or pictures in the streets or working with the community, whatever. So I think that, that it's also about 
learning, this, uh, teaching the students how to see their material or their stories in a much broader perspective. It's not about making a book, just like it, it's not like making a story for a magazine. Uh, of course, you can train that in the beginning, but when you come to the, the, the longer stories or the more important work that the students do, they have to look at it in a much more broader perspective so that they can actually reach different audience, audiences on different platforms. I think that's much more interesting. Um, so, and yes, we work with photo books, but we also work with yeah, online storytelling or exhibitions or stuff, other stuff like that. Yeah, I really love photo books, but I sometimes have the idea that um, it's always looking for solutions, you know, and then they found out now it's not so easy with the magazines anymore, so we can do photo books. And then you can do something else. And it's not about this, that you have to do a photo book for every story, every project you'd like to show. Of course, you have to search for uh, ways of publicate your projects or to be seen because that's an idea most of you probably have. But I think it's always very important to reflect, reflect which kind of project do I have and which ways maybe would suit the best to make it seen somehow. And it's not that because photo books work now and I heard they don't work that well anymore, I don't know. So it's not just jumping on this train because someone says now it's photo books. And that's what I don't like about it that much. Even if I love looking at photo books. And I think I, I know a lot of projects where it's the perfect way to, to publish it. Yeah, but the thing is also that most of the photo books made are made for photographers, other photographers. So, so if you want to communicate to the world, which might, I think must be our main uh, goal, then we shouldn't be making photo books. Then we should make, use the money to print the pictures somewhere else. And I think that's, uh, again, the thing that you must put into the minds of, of the, the students that you have. Where do you want your pictures to go and why? Who are, who are the, the audience for your work? Because if your audience is other photographers, it might be nice to make a booklet and a, a limited edition of a photo book and then sell it to 100 other photographers. But then you don't change anything and you don't reach your, your audience and then you might be successful within this room, but you might not be successful out there where the rest of the world is. Maybe I can try and bring the conversation back. You have a question, Valentina? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt the, the actual talk. Um, no, because we're talking about photo books, and I'm, I'm a publisher of photo books, editor as well, so maybe I can uh, ask you a specific question. Um, so we have a limitation, uh, which is a book form. The book form means we have covers, it, there's a structure, there are paper, the, the pages are one after the other. Uh, the storytelling will be told from the beginning to the end, but with the freedom of the reader, to go back and forth, open the book in the middle. So there is no structure in storytelling, but there is a, an invisible structure, which is the, the limitation of the book form itself. When you mentioned that um, we, should, we, we always make photo books for photographers, just for photographers only, it's because we have this limitation of the book form itself. Um, if, you, if you open a book, usually you have uh, words. And the words have space for imagination, much more than a, pho a photograph. The photograph is image itself. Uh, the, the space for imagination is given by an image. So you will always look at an image first, and then your imagination will, will move on. But when you have a word, the word is much more yeah, illimited for, ima for a space of, of, of imagination, because it just is a chair. Whatever chair it, it is will be different for everybody. It's not an, an image given. So when you say that is uh, uh, the photo book is uh, just for photographers, then we should be starting teaching how to read first, and then how to write. So how to make a book. But if you read 
within photographers, I mean, among photographers, uh, how do you teach the, the actual imagination? How do you teach how to talk to people that they don't know what an image is about? How do you teach to go beyond the image itself? And that's the main problem that we all face in here, in this room, and in every single photography festival, because we always talk, photographers talk with photographers. We know what an image is about. Uh, go in the street and ask anybody to read an image. They will just look at the first reaction, I mean the first uh, symbolism of it. It's a, it's a chair, that's nothing else. Why do we have a lot of space for imagination and why they don't? How do you teach that? to photographers that they will need to talk to people that they are not literate in photography. So maybe as teachers, we should start asking ourselves this question. How do we communicate with the outside world? I, I don't think that um, the people who went to photo schools only know how to read images. There can be multiple reading of the same thing. The kind of language we have learned that can be one language to to decode and understand an image, and there can be multiple um, different uh, kind of language. Of course, you know you can say. Uh, I give you an example. You know, few years back, if you uh, if you have told anyone uh, in Bangladesh that there will be a concert of Hindustani classical music, Indian classical music, do you think there will be people? Everybody will say no. Like nobody understands Indian classical music. No, it's very difficult to wrap. You know, Bengal has started to do Indian classical music, and now if you go to that concert at four four in the morning, you will see a full of stadium in Dhaka, completely filled up. There is no one, and everybody is pin drop silence. And you can tell, of course. There can be academic training to understand Indian classical music, but do we always need the same kind of training to understand and appreciate uh, any kind of art form? Uh, if somebody wants to be like Alisha, of course, they can study and they can write papers and blah, blah, blah. Sorry, this is a joke. But, uh, but, there, but there can be also someone like me, you know, who can just stumble upon an image or a book that I fall in love with, and then I will find a way to decode it. And if, we, if I don't find a way to decode it and still I'm in love with it, that's also okay. Um, and I think, you know, there is, um, I really do think there are too many photo books. There should be, I wish that there, there, there is a regulation that you can't publish more than one photo book every five years. There's just too many objects, you know, and there are too many campaigns, you know, buy my photo book, buy this, buy that. There's too many competitions. Now there is God, God. God knows how many festivals just on photo books, you know. There must be something wrong in our society, you know. Nobody talks about content. Nobody talks about what the work is about. Everybody talks about this is this design, this flap, this paper. Give me a break. I want to I want to test the food, you know. But this, this is, is my, this is my <laughs> question actually. This is exactly my question. So <coughs> sorry, uh, this is my question. Now it's gonna be a debate. No, 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 uh, but everybody can say, ask questions now. With the, Finished. Thank Please. You. Thank you. Here the master comes. Now you know why we have chosen her to offer the book. Thank you, Alicia. Carry on. All this romantic presentation of yourself when I fall in love with the book. And then when I go back to it. And you know if I still didn't understand it, half the people in this room, room know how Big academic you are. Please. Mm. Okay, okay, don't worry. <laughs> oh, sorry, and now I'm thinking of you saying, oh, I'm in love, I'm in love with photo books too, but actually I hate photography and photo books as well. Now, uh, the, my question is exactly that, so the, the content, because my, my main concern about storytelling, my main concern about photography, my main concern about reading photography is what the hell is about. So I don't want to, I don't need always meanings. But I need clues. I need to, to know what the photographer wants to say. I need answers because I have a lot of questions. Because again, I'm, what, what I'm talking about with I'm talking about imagination. I'm, I'm saying I have uh, uh, an image that doesn't give me a specific uh, direct meaning. And thanks God, it's, it's like that. 
uh, raise questions in me. So the content should be told. Uh, photo, book are, uh, photo books are just uh, a way to tell a story. Uh, mm, of course, we have me multimedia now. Uh, we have uh, we we can use music. We can use uh, with, with with images. We can use words with images. We can use uh, videos. Uh, but the problem is, how do we talk? How do we use words? Uh, let's stop talking about photography as a language. It's not a language. If it was a language, there would be code, codes, it would be codified, and it would be understandable to everybody in the same way. And absolutely is not. And this is the beauty of photography, the ambiguity of it. The fact that everybody will understand something different. So how do we talk about a language that is not a language? I'm going to try and actually respond to that because I've been teaching at an institute called Gyan Prava in Bombay for the last year, which is a course on critical theory, aesthetics and practice. And none of my students were photographers. But I did a seminar with them on uh, a short history of Indian color photography, looking at the work of Raghubir Singh. It's quite a difficult photographer to understand if you haven't been introduced to photography before. And he, you know, at, Quite a long time ago, he was producing, uh, he, he produced about 13 photo books in his lifetime. Um, and while Wasif might make fun of me for the desire to write papers, etc., um, the reason I started looking at theory and history is for exactly this reason that there was a way in which I wanted to be able to speak about different images, and that language didn't seem to exist within conversations with other photographers in the photography community. I did find it extremely helpful to study photographic theory and art history in order to find the languages that have now helped me understand what it is, what is it that happens when you're editing a sequence, right? You talked about editing, you say, okay, you lay out the images on the floor and we move them around. But it's a very, people have mystified the process completely. As often as we might want to talk about teachers as facilitators, we are very much living within an environment where the idea that someone comes in, they give you a lecture, they know more than you do, you pass on the knowledge, and the similar thing happens because people have mystified a lot of these processes that seem to inherently make you a better photographer. But there are theoretical ways of understanding what is happening between two or three images. So I also think the, the kind of backlash against uh, the idea of theory and history, which seems very embedded within the photography community sometimes. I don't know about abroad, but here, especially within um, institutions that are teaching, saying that okay, this is too academic, this is you know, kind of uh, feeding away from a language of, of affect, um, I think that's harmed us in terms of exactly what Valentina has pointed out in the long term, in terms of being able to own the language of what it is we're doing as photographers, rather than having um, the academic field actually come in and define it for us. So, yeah, I mean, Karen, perhaps you can respond to this. Is there a way in which, you know, uh, theory actually provides us the tools? And is there a way in which we can kind of reclaim theory from the academy and instrumentalize it within the photography community so that it's not an alienating process or a process that seems, that seems foreign? <clears throat> yeah, I think, of course, uh, theory and cultural studies and all the different subjects we know um, can provide a language, but I think it's even more important that we um, think about strategies how to combine it, that it's not this thing that we think there are the people who know how we can decode it or, you know, to find the words. And when you were talking, I wasn't so sure if I got it wrong, but I think there's no way of translating images into words. And I think in a way, um, it's both a ways of representation, and both of them never completely succeed to, um, uh, I'm not saying difficult in English actually, um, complete to, to, uh, to name exactly what they refer to in reality or whatever. So I think they are not so different in a way. Our problem is that when we talk about photography, of course, we need words, and we try somehow to around it, but we'll never find a one-to-one -one translation of what we've seen in the image. That's because 
it's also completely clear to me that there are many different ways of reading images. And of course, we all would read a different, and of course, we all would say it's a chair or whatever, if we know what a chair is. But we can see it in the history when we look at pictures that completely have changed their meaning because they were used in different contexts, they were filled up with different meaning, and they, they worked inside that. And I think, in a special way, it could also work with text like that. In a different way, but they are also open. If we think about poetry, for example, it's not this simple thing that it always tells, this is the meaning, and we all know what, what's it about. Um, I, I think it's a longer conversation and you got me a little bit wrong, so we can have it later, yeah. Nine. If I can uh, add something to this whole discussion about how much language, whether the theory is something we should own, etc. Um, it's not a full point, I'm just going to go through an example. So this is a phenomenon of the artist talk, which can be whatever, photographer, filmmaker, etc. talking about his own practice. Here at Shobhi Mala, we've got Arundhati Roy, for example, giving an artist talk at the end of the thing. So it can be all mediums, broadly. And one of the things that's understood about that format is somebody's presenting excerpts from their work and then talking about it. One way is they tell the story of how they got there. In other ways, they explain the significance of the work. And we especially find ourselves doing the second when it's a longer slot. We feel we've already told you how we got there. We need to explain the significance. We need to actually give you the interpretation. We need to give you the theory around it. Whether that's the theory that led us to the work or the theory that helps us understand it afterwards, right? And it's a choice. Some people choose to do it and some people choose to cut off at the point of presenting. And I think this is where some of this is coming in and also the teaching because you use the word owning the language, right? And there might be some pushback about owning the language. And there's a whole discussion about whether photographers should become theorists as well. Um, and there's a whole discussion in art schools um, about whether too much theory immobilizes, let's say, a painter or a sculptor, right? Whether that much theory burdens you. And I've personally been in studio crits, not with photographers, but painters and sculptors, where I feel like I'm seeing a beautiful work. And when they're explaining it, sometimes the work is collapsing because they're now adding all the theory they've read in this class, and their work needs to speak for it. While on the one hand, it's a fantastic painting, why can't I just sit with it? And there's a whole question about explaining and over-explaining, and I especially think, and I'm not resolved about this, but there's a question about when the maker, let's say the photographer, explains their own work, whether that shuts off everything else. Because when the photographer tells you what it's about, and what theory is applied, you feel that's the definitive answer, right? and it closes off certain readings. Whereas I always find it interesting when somebody else does the reading. I personally experience people reading my works and giving an explanation where I've thought, oh, I wish I had thought of that. Honestly, I've never even read that book that you've referenced. Now I need to look it up, right? But this person has already read that image into it. They've not produced a double meaning, which I couldn't have produced. And I think part of what's also going on, not just here, but many other places, for all sorts of reasons, including practical, is you have practitioners who are also the teachers, who are straddling the line of making work and teaching work, and even sometimes producing theory about the work. And I'm not advocating which way it should go, but I think it'd be quite interesting if the field expands so much, and so many more people go into it, that there are people who, as teachers, see their work as interpreting other people's work, that's sometimes not enough for people. I mean, I've had conversations with Tanzim where I've said, oh, do you miss making work work? And he has said to me, actually curating this discursive process, this is now my work. And I've realized I've gotten stuck in the idea of somebody who's graduated from Patshala must also be making photographs, otherwise, what's going on? Why are they just curating? Or why are they just writing about it? So I'm not advocating and everybody's choices are different and people, multiple have, but I think part of the conversation is also stuck in perhaps us trying to collapse all these roles into just ourselves and feeling inadequate when we can do one and not the other. Um, and that's partially also because there's not enough of the other people, there's not enough theorists, there's not enough art critics, no one takes on art criticism as a full-time job, no one takes on academia as a full-time job. Um, and I'm not saying they should either, but I think if there are more people, then you have also maybe a different set of people up here and in the audience, and you free some people 
Um, and I think there's a whole conversation also about accessing your inner space. And for some people, too much theory doesn't prevent them from reaching it. And for some people, it does. Um, and that may be also OK. Um, and I think there's a whole conversation about self-consciousness and whether you become too self-conscious about work. Sometimes I do see some work, and I think, oh god, this work is trying to prove that theory so badly. And I just want this person to just be themselves and just be as punk as they want to be and not have to worry about also <coughs> matching with this big book on this kind of photography that's out there. It's very hard to make a general statement about this subject in particular because we have such two diverse contexts, you know. In the West, you have this kind of overpopulation of PhDs coming out of the humanities where people are talking about there not being enough jobs in the humanities and the arts, whereas here, the jobs don't even exist. Even if you are an art historian in South Asia, how many places can you possibly get hired? They don't even have, in India, for example, uh, the basic test that you have to pass to become a teacher in a college is called the NET. There is no such thing as an NET. There is no net in art history right, that you can take. The process doesn't even exist to, to, to enter a department. We have three, maximum four. And that's, you know, so absolutely, it's, it's uh, the infrastructure. The infrastructures are very different. Um, and they also end up, I think, predicating what happens. Um, yeah. um, I'm just adding something to Naeem and reflecting some of the things Valentina said. I think this position of that we need to understand everything is very problematic. And this position of we need to explain everything is also very problematic and it limits a lot of different things, you know. And I will refer to this film by Akira Kurosawa, which I've seen uh, when I was very, very young. I don't know if Shine Bai is here. There used to be a film screening here by Johira and Film Society. And all the hi fi people used to come to see these foreign films. Now it's all in the internet and you can download and see. Um, and there was this film called Roshomon, I guess everybody knows, you know, where. The same story are told by three, four different people, and there are multiple versions of the same story. The question is, do we really have space for this multiple version of existence? Uh, and I think this pressure of, um, especially in, the, in our community, that you, know, you need to give a quite a solid theoretical fit groundwork uh, to your work, also fed to some kind of curatorial framework. You know, I remember listening to this YouTube talk. Um, I don't know what's her full name, Rubina, the curator of Kirunada Foundation. Um, how she have met Nasrin Mohammadi, which is one of my favorite artists of all time. And she said she was a student and Nasrin was a teacher. And Nasrin was someone who, who was always in solitude, you know, who was not going there, doing this, doing that. She was always within herself. And if you look at Nasrin's drawing, you can easily understand that. And she said, it's very rare that Nasrin asks her students to come home, or anyone, because she wants to have her own space. But one day, because uh, she was a very close um, um, student of Nasrin, she asked um, Rubina to come to her house to pick up something. And then Rubina went, and she went to her house, and she thought, oh wow, I'm going to house of such a fascinating artist. There will be so many things. And she went to the, uh, her studio, and she saw there's nothing. There's simply nothing. There's a lower table where she sits and draw, and there's nothing in the walls. And she was thinking that there was a slight uncomfortness, you know, like something wrong. And then she went back again in one night, and she saw there are reflections of trees that falls in her walls. And that creates beautiful forms. And when Nasrin used to draw, she was very fond of Hindustan classical music, specifically vocals. And you see these geometric patterns in her work. And of course, Rubin is a curator. But I always imagine that if she didn't know the process of Nasrin, what kind of take she will have on Nasrin as a curator, you know? You can explain her work in the global context, you know? You can compare her with Agnes Martin and say, you know, she was this abstract modernist painter. But I think there need to be a certain kind of sensibility, you know, to, to, to everything. And it can be different sense of sensibility. And I think with theory, there's also a question of power, you know? The kind of language you use and the way you 
plays it. And also it's the role of a teacher, you know, you say it in the beginning. And I, I am actually very uncomfortable. I'm not teaching for two years because I think I need to study. And this role of a teacher where you pretend that you know everything so well is so problematic. And where the whole world is shifting, maybe you started teaching, I don't know, God knows, 15 years back and you were a professor in some university and you hold a role and you are still a professor. It just doesn't work. <laughs> but I'm saying, but I think there should be spaces for um, there, there, there should be spaces which, which should not be static, you know, um, and we should be in a position and have flexibility to really uh, challenge ourselves and um, reflect on everyone with a little bit more sensitivity. Yeah, I think that's the role of a teacher. I'd like just like to go one step back uh, and to say something about some things you mentioned. Um, when I'm um, proposing to study theory as well, um, I don't mean that it should give the photographer um, the words to explain his own work. And I would never say, definitely not, that um, his work should be the illustration of a theory he read somewhere and probably it will be a bad illustration. For me, the point to raise it is that um, to make clear that nobody of us is kind of part of a neutral space just to find from within something. You know, that reminds me of the myth of the 19th century, what should be an artist, not be connected to society and to somehow create only out of himself. And I think that's not the point. So it's, that's the reason why I think it's really important to study all these different things and to find out that maybe in the things you feel that might come right out of yourself, um, they connect to all these other things because you're always part of the culture and they influence you and also theories <coughs> influence you even if you have never read them because they maybe raise some points which are important and you experience in other ways. So that's more the way why I think it's important not to have um, intelligent words to somehow sure. propose. Yeah. Uh, Vanessa Winship, I don't know if she's here. Yeah. She spoke about being taught by Victor Bogan and how this kind of helped her understand <coughs> the psychological terrain that she might be traversing as she was making she dances on Jackson, right? So, but we'll take, uh, if there are more questions, we'll take them all together and then the panelists can collectively respond. So, I'm not sure if we have that time. Okay. Anyone else? We do have time for, I mean, yeah? Okay, yeah, so two, qu two questions at the back there, and then Adam here. So we, Alan first, since he's been raising his hand for some time, and then then. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. And Sagar, four four questions, and then. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, I think that I had my hand up for something else earlier on, um, which was actually about the theory practice kind of dichotomy and the way that was being set up there. Um, I guess my question, if I have one, is. I'm wondering, we haven't, the word critical hasn't come up much. I don't know if it's come up at all. It seems to me that that's maybe part of what's missing in that conversation and, and, and trying to bridge that binary between the idea that the theory is to be, that is leading or the theory is irrelevant versus practice being dominant, you know, that, that what's missing is critical thinking, critical reflection, and I'm sure that's part of all the pedagogies and stuff that are involved, but um, I just wonder if it needs to be pulled out and fleshed out explicitly. Just to... um, uh, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity. So I have two questions actually. Uh, first of all, uh, 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 I captured a photo once and uh, as usual I showed it to a couple, pe couple of people because it was kind of a favorite of my uh, mind. And I uploaded it on Facebook. So what happened after that, that that photo was liked by many people. In fact, it, it was copied, it was shared in many various pages. Mass people liked it, mass people. But the problem was when I showed that, showed that exact picture to the photo experts or the senior photographers or professional photographers, they, they were like, how it could be so popular? 
how is it possible for a photo like this to be get so viral? So I was in a dilemma that mass people are liking this picture so much, but the photo experts are not, not liking it at all. In fact, they were bashing that how it, it could get so much viral. That's one question. And the second question is like, uh, since you mentioned about that uh, abstract or art, uh, sometimes when I uh, walk down the road, I love I love street photo photography. So sometimes uh, there are some kind of moment you never know, just uh, gets your attention. So suppose a ray of a sun gets my attention and I capture it. But uh, it's kind of meaningful to me, though there is no meaning. But it's kind of meaningful to me. But to other people, it's very hard for them to understand that why, what's the meaning of this picture? So. I am I am always confused about this abstract thing that how can I make it concrete to people? So these were my two questions. Thank you. Hi, I am uh, Aditya from India, and uh, I've been practicing photography for about 13, 14 years. And um, one of my dilemmas is that I have not had any formal education, and mostly been working through self-taught methods. And one crossroad that I always come to is that I always feel the lack of formal education. But I almost feel like there's a dichotomy between if I were to be practicing through formal education, whether it is to do with um, photography school, whether it is to do with drama school, whether it is to do with design school, you end up becoming a part of a structure and there's a certain language that you follow. Now, obviously, I've not had that, so I've been outside and removed from that. I always seem to find, trying to figure out whether that applies. Should one be reaching that point? How do we bridge that gap? Uh, my question is to everyone, uh, you know, because this is about should photography be taught in all corners of the world? You know? And then there's a, there's a different school in Bangladesh. There's a, there's a different kind of school of thought in Nepal, in Denmark in all different countries, you know. And then uh, my question is, you know, there's a generation of photographers that are being, that are coming up, uh, looking at photography done by um, most European photographers that have produced a tremendous quality of work, in, you know, um, which was influenced by a particular period of time that, in which that country or that community or that society went through. You know, Let's, let's talk about Japanese photography. Uh, there was a, there was an era uh, when it were photographers like that, the Moriyama, uh, you know, Masai uh, Fukase, or you know, they they uh, they produced work that was that had a lot to do with their experience about uh, the war, you know, and, and and likewise in German photography, there's a different school of photography that that is uh, the work was produced because. Now, when you, you know, influenced by the, the society and thought that the people of Germany uh, must have gone through and the war again, you know, that, that period of time. So we in Nepal or in Bangladesh, wherever, you know, where we are, we are like, we are so, uh, we learn those photographers and how much of a difference, you know, we, we are being taught photography uh, about in that way, um, my question is very, um, you know, uh, this is scattered, but please make, try to make sense of it. I need the answer. <laughs> Suit photography we taught in one place um, with the references and uh, influence of that place. Yeah? <laughs> The uh, item was, should photography be taught? And I think it's worthwhile unpacking both words. Because there seems to be the implication here when we're talking of photography uh, that we forget that there are two elements to it. One is the profession of photography, and, you know, to get a job, to get a career. And sometimes that's what people go to learn. And there is the craft of photography, uh, which may not be related to a job. And I, I see no reason why someone who wants to learn photography necessarily has to become a photographer. Someone who is a, might want to learn photography just for the heck of it. And I, I think that's perfectly valid. The other is 
the term teaching itself, because there is also implied that teaching is formalized teaching. I'm a self-taught photographer. Why does that make it less teaching? If I'm teaching myself, then someone else in a formal stru structure, whether there's a credit at the end and I'm giving a degree or that sort of thing. Um, and it's worthwhile just stepping back to think of that. But I, I would like to look at the environment of teaching as, um, as the aspect to study, if you like. My mother was a teacher, and she, she set up a school. She pitched a tent in the middle of a playground, got some kids, set up a school which became the largest school and college in the country. And I joined the school, and my mother was horrified that I kept dropping out of school. I dropped out of so many schools, and you know, this is very embarrassing for my mother. But anyway, I, I go to a new school, and there's, a, there's this Mr. Baksh. Uh, we used to call him Baksh or something. <laughs> so, Mr. Baksh used to teach English, and you know, my first day in school, and it's a rainy day, and the, it's a, write a description of a rainy day. This is very typical in our country. We have very thick books which have descriptions of rainy days, a visit to a tea stall, and all those sort of things, and we memorize it. And when it comes, the question's there, we give the answer. That's very good. I, my first day in school, and I sort of felt lyrical and I, it was a rainy day, so I, I sort of wrote as I wanted. I, I thought I'd done quite well. And this te teacher looks at it, who's this, who's written it? I thought, yeah, I'm standing up. I've been recognized, you know, I'm very happy about this. <laughs> so this guy comes up and he pulls my ear and he goes, I don't want philosophers in my class. Yeah. Now, the problem is, for most teachers, it's very difficult to deal with philosophers in their class. They can deal very easily with whether you've answered the right question or not, whether they've done those all the, all the things that you do or not. But as soon as you get someone out of the box, the teacher is in a problem. And I, as, as a teacher, my problem is, within, say, Pakshala, for instance, some of the most troublesome students have also been the most interesting ones. They're the ones who don't obey the rules. They're the ones who cause the most, of, you know, they, they create hell for you. Yet they're producing fantastic work and you want them to continue doing that. And I, I think the job of the teacher primarily is A, to unlearn all the things that have happened before. Because all we've been taught in school is to conform at various levels. And the confidence to not have to conform I think it's a, it's a very important attribute that a teacher needs to get across. And our entire process of evaluation requires conformity. You know, you pass exams, you have all these criteria, and teachers go through that and everything else. And I suspect that if all that a teacher is able to do is help you to love and appreciate the medium, and that can be, there can be many ways of doing that, at the end of the day, that's a very worthwhile pursuit. And why can we not allow that to be a recognition of teaching and learning? Um, otherwise, we get stuck in this debate. It's a follow-up to So if I can just add. Um, taking some words from what Wasif had said earlier about the environment of teaching rather than whether it should be, um, you use the word trauma um, for the sort of schools that you didn't like, which sounds like the sort of schools that Shoyed Alam went through. Um, and then you talked about how there's a need for vulnerability, uh, which brings up the question of safe space. And we all saw in this Chobi Mela very welcome that there's a whole statement about safe space safe space from sexual harassment, etc. But I also think about safe space from harassment of students by that kind of oppressive environment. Um, you use the word love. Um, and I think that's not just love for subject, but love for fellow students, from students and from teachers. I, I wouldn't say that that's always been solved in the classrooms. Um, you gave an example of Sultan as, this, as the person who didn't fit, right? And Tanzim confirmed that he dropped out of school. And that's probably somebody who was defiant um, and said no. Then you emphasize the question of saying no, right? Um, and the example again was given of disobedient students. So we valorize disobedient students, um, but I would like us to also think about whether enough is being done 
to encourage the disobedience. Because I think for the most part, the disobedient students are still breaking through. The majority are not necessarily having the environment um, to break through. I'll just give one small example that's always in my head whenever I switch from English to Bangla, which is the pronouns we use, right? Apni and tumi, uh, she and tini, and bhai and apa. And the moment we switch to English, which we're doing in this bilingual situation, we are at least just in that small space of language, suddenly free of recognizing your age or your hierarchy. It's a very small thing for most of us saying bhai, apa, apni, tumi is instinctive and we'll say bhai about or apa about our teachers forever, uh, no matter what the thing. But it's also part of this thing and I think disobedient students get through, but perhaps more needs to be done to create a safe space um, for the argument that we say we want. Because argument or argumentativeness doesn't just get born, it has to be encouraged, not just through the exceptions, but by creating a space for it. Okay, that kind of brought us the whole world around and back again. It feels like from a critical to giving space for the students to work. Um, I don't know how to answer all these questions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, but but I would like to pick the last one then because I think that the the rule of uh, or the the role of, of our school at least is to uh, to give this uh, space of freedom because I know that that not like like here where you where you literally need a space of freedom we don't need that in, in our part of the world but still the students need a, a, a a space where they can actually work uh, freely without any um, uh, any parents or any media or any society asking what to do of them. And I think that's uh, that's actually really an important role for even a school in the, in our world, in the in the Western part of the world. Um, and then I will just take what you said, Saga, because I think that that. Uh, you can't take away the history of, of somebody. You can't take away the culture or the history of where you come from and the pictures that you have seen and uh, what, you have, what you have in your backpack of uh, wherever cu culture you come from and which pictures you've seen. You can't take that away. But the thing that you can do, which I think is, is really, really important when you, when you teach photography, is that you can show them other cultures and you can show them where other people come from. And that's when we come back to what we talk about, that you also need to know, know about history. You need to know about other types of photography, because then you, then you also understand where uh, other photographers come from, and you can learn from that. And that's also why we, at our school, really love to bring a lot of international students together from all over the world, because they get better when they know about each other. And there are so many questions, it's really a bit difficult. Maybe I pick up the Facebook question because I like that one. And um, because you said about this situation that all the professionals said this is not a good image and it was liked so much on Facebook. And I think um, this is for me is the perfect example that I would say uh, there is uh, this discourse about good images I really don't like because I think in some ways a bad image in some context can be a good image in other ones. And that's exactly what you experience with your image. It's not that this is the one image that works for everything, but in different contexts, it plays different roles. So you can find a lot of people on Facebook who like it, and other people say, for this and this, and re this reason, I maybe found it critical <laughs> um, to, to shoot an image like this, or it opens up this problematic situation or whatever. So, so I wouldn't wonder about that. Yeah, maybe another question because you said about, <clears throat> we didn't mention the word critical because I'm not so sure that I might have mentioned it. When I say um, that for me it's so important to go into this uh, meta discourse and to reflect on how image work how, and to ask how they might matter, how they can matter, then for me it's completely part of maybe critical thinking and thinking about what, what, how can you make your images matter, uh, maybe to change society or to influence it somehow. So I think we didn't really miss it. 
Um, I don't know what to answer. This is actually very surprising. There are so many people in this room listening to this talk on teaching. I thought the room would be empty and people would be hanging out outside having coffee. There must be something <laughs> wrong within us. Anyway, uh, just replying to uh, what Aditya said about being in school and not being in school. I think you can be influenced by anyone and everyone. It's also a matter of a choice, you know. And I think uh, learning can be, as Shrithul said, can be um, extremely personal or it can be extremely collaborative. So it depends from person to person. I don't think if somebody, if they don't go to a school, they will be completely fresh or naive or very unique, you know. Like you can be shaped by thousands of things every day. Uh, for me, it was a blessing that there was a place like Patshala because um, I didn't manage to pass almost all my exams in my um, uh, school life and my parents were terrified that what, you, what we are going to do with this boy. But because I went to Patshala and I think it gave me a voice uh, and it gave me a space to dream and it gave me a space that, uh, that I can do many things. And I think uh, that's very rare, you know? And, um, and it was not about that, that after when we will come out from Patshala, we will get a lovely job, or I don't know, you'll be doing this assignment, that assignment. That was never a point. You know, having a school in Dhaka and for Rafi for the last 20 years, I think it's quite a statement, uh, given the context, the kind of world we are living in. And, uh, yeah, and a lot of times we actually disagree with each other. Like I disagree with Shwedul, Shwedul disagree with, with me most of the times. But we still can walk together and uh, move ahead. And we still can party and dance. And uh, Shwedul can go to jail and come back and <laughs> have, have this conversation. It's all part, part of the front line. And I think, you know, um, there are two different things between becoming disobedient and uh, there can be also students who don't know how to communicate. You know, there can be many issues. There can be huge problems in the family. You know, I have students who came to me and told me, you know, I don't have money to print my images to show in the class. So I think it's not only about good students and bad students. We live in a part of the world where um, some of you have got into a double pickup bus, but just go from point A to point B, there can be a lot of issues. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I don't think anyone is surprised to learn that Wasit might have failed a few exams in school. <laughs> no, but uh, I think uh, just two words that I'll end with is the idea of equality and community. Um, how to bring those two uh, notions into our space of education. And thank you to all our panelists who have been really wonderful today. And thank you to all of uh, you for coming. And we can continue this conversation later tonight. <laughs>